Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, uh, which is entitled Feeling Apart While Being Apart, which is going to focus on the experience of for children and this, yeah, for the parents of those children who are the one or two kids who are still being educated remotely while the majority of the class is being educated in person and the unique uh, challenges that that poses. But before I begin, I, begin, I want to um, as I often like to quote the rabbi of the community where I grew up who used to begin his sermon with, before I speak, I want to say something. So before I speak, I would also like to say something. And first of all, thank OHEL for the opportunity. My, as I mentioned, my name is Norm Blumenthal. I coordinate the OHEL Bereavement and Trauma Team. I'm also hosting the event tonight. And uh, our trauma team is a team of several uh, me licensed mental health professionals been trained in dealing with trauma and bereavement situations. Whereas in the past, we've been involved with many of even some of the, the well-recorded trauma such as the Pittsburgh shooting, floods in, in Houston, Malibu fires, the Jersey City shooting, the, the assault in Muncie. Most recently, we've been very busy, as many of you may know, with the issues centering around uh, the COVID-19 and the challenges that that poses. Uh, the, uh, I want to thank uh, OHEL, it's uh, CEO David Mendel and the Presidium uh, of Mel Zachter and Jay Kestenbaum and make it possible for us to do this. I also want to acknowledge uh, the contribution and participation of the UJA that has also, United Jewish Appeal, that has made this possible for us to continue to do these types of webinars, as well as the various types of groups and individual services that we provide. Um, upcoming webinars will be also focusing on those specific populations that need assistance. We will be doing next week with, uh, again, with Mrs. Ross, who I'll introduce uh, sh uh, shortly, um, the very same topic, but for the teachers in terms of helping teachers with this challenge of having majority of students in class and some learning remotely. We are in this Wednesday night, together with Dina Garbos, we will be doing a, a webinar on the long haul, the long-term the long term effects of, of COVID and even among those who have recovered from COVID, uh, and the impact that it's having on the individual and the family. Um, and uh, Dina Garbuz is for, for the family of the, one of the first people that had were diagnosed uh, with the ailment. And we also are in the process of planning and we've been announcing shortly a, a, a special webinar for parents of children with ADHD and uh, how this, uh, the intermittent quarantine and use of remote learning and other, and the restrictions and the necessity for health precautions are, are processed and best managed for children with ADHD. Um, I also want to, uh, first of all, say that it's a great honor to share the podium. It's a power raw, so you'll hear from late, from soon, who is a premier educator in our community, is a coordinator of Judaic studies for Amaz Middle School. And she will be obviously focusing on this topic from the teacher academic perspective uh, for those for you parents who probably all have children um, who are learning remotely while most of the school is lear uh, learning uh, in class. Um, now, in terms of questions, it isn't a very large group, so um, we could conceivably have people ask questions live if you want, but what seems to have always worked best is if people use the chat option. For those of you not familiar with it, at the bottom of your computer and somewhere on your telephones, I don't use a telephone, I don't know, there is an icon among the icons. One of them is the chat option and you can pose questions or even input uh, on the chat uh, in the chat area. There are, we're going to tell you one of three ways in which this can be done. Uh, one is just to ask, if you're not, if you're not uh, hesitant to let yourself be known, uh, you can ask the ch or question or put in the comment to everybody and everyone will see who it comes from. If you want more privacy uh, with your question, then please address it to me. Uh, Norm Blumenthal is the host, and uh, I will read the question anonymously um, and address it so you wouldn't be known as the one who was asking that question, if that's your preference. And the other option is if you have a specific question or issue that you don't want to announce, I want to ask, but you want to address that at some subsequent point by either myself or Ms. Ross, uh, please uh, you know, send it privately to me or privately to Ms. Ross and... Uh, 
uh, please mention in the question that you don't want this to be read out loud and how we can contact you so we can address it with you further. Again, also any issues or concerns being again on behalf of OHEL that people feel need further discussion, you can certainly contact us and we'll, we'll, be, we'll provide that assistance as we have for the last eight, nine months since this uh, pandemic has begun. Um, okay, you know, in terms of now, my piece will be more psychological and then Ms. Ross will follow. I'll be about 20 minutes, she'll be about 20 minutes, which will leave us actually now with about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll see, but somewhere in that vicinity. Um, my, you know, uh, but my perspective will be the psychological one. And what we, where we have done in terms of picking our topics is we sort of culled from the people who call us individually, the people that reached out to help, what seems to be the light motifs, what seem to be the themes that people are struggling with and perceive we can provide assistance in, in those specific areas. And this has been one of the themes that has come up. This has been one of the concerns that people have brought up in terms of they're usually the ones who are calling are either the teachers or the parents of children who for a host of reasons, which I'll go over soon, um, have to continue with remote learning even when the bulk of the class is uh, learning in person. Um, and we're often playing catch up. That seems to be human nature. Uh, and we found that throughout this pandemic that we're, we, we have problems. This, is, this situation is, is quite unprecedented. So we have challenges and situations and we have to then sort of figure out how we're gonna handle it. And uh, so we're always sort of like chasing our tail. And because again, this is so unprecedented in terms of trying to figure out how to manage situations. Um, I find that there are several categories of people who find themselves in this predicament where their child is still learning remote while most of the children are in school. First of all, it could very well be somebody who is a child themselves or a family member who is immune compromised and therefore the, the risks of contracting the illness could be far more devastating and therefore they have to take added precautions and the added precautions of not even, even as they're attending a school which may be having, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, adhering to the strictest guidelines of safety, whether it's masks, plexiglass, distancing, hand washing, etc. But even that more remote chance of uh, contracting the illness would be so devastating. So they have to stay home. It's some of them are, are children who have members of the family working, living at home. Usually, parents are working healthcare facilities, and therefore, again, if they became carriers, if the parents became carriers and took it with them to this healthcare facility, again, the, uh, it could be a nursing home, it could be a hospital, consequences would be very serious, and therefore, the family as a whole has to take the added precaution. Therefore, the child in this case, and many of the other case, um, cases that I'm mentioning, is actually doing it for the sake of other people's health, and not, not, even, not only their own. Again, I said, if there's a parent who's immune, or a sibling, who for whatever reason is immune compromised, and they're doing it for the sake of that person, not ne necessarily their own. Uh, there are those who have already lost a parent, and this is an issue, again, uh, unfortunately, we have seen uh, as a result of the illness that young parents uh, have died, and therefore, with young children still living at home, and the, 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 the consequences of the other parent contracting the illness, again, has very serious consequences, and therefore, as an added precaution to make sure that the surviving parent is safe and healthy, the child will, will stay home from school and, and learn remotely. And uh, then there's some who have had the long haul effects, as I mentioned, that we'll be talking about shortly, and therefore are still quite sick. And then if the other parent were to get sick as well and be compromised in their capacity to function, then that would uh, you know, create a very serious problem for the family and therefore the children are learning remotely. And then there's one other group which we're gonna address so shortly, and I'm saying this without an iota of judgment, but I think has to be acknowledged as well, is either parents or the child themselves who have high levels of anxiety high levels of worry and may their worry may be greater or disproportionate to, uh, or not disproportionate, let's say, but are more extreme than the average person, whoever that is. And I'm gonna say this without an iota of judgment because we are all different. And some, some people are by nature and for no reason of their own and not because they've been parented wrong or anything like that, but just are much more prone to anxiety and therefore the dread and fear of possibly contracting this illness is much greater than the average person and therefore they're taking that precaution of the child themselves. 
may be a child with high levels of anxiety. Again, not because they haven't been parented well or anything of the sort. For example, we find that gifted children, and I'm sure Mr. Ross can speak about this better than I can, uh, intellectually gifted children tend to be prone to, to more anxiety or whatever it might be, but because of the high levels of anxiety are not willing to take the chance of going to school, even when all the safety precautions are being practiced. So these are, that's the, using broad talks, but as you'll notice also, because I will come and come back to that towards the end of my talk, Many of them are children who are doing this for the sake of someone else. And that's an important consideration uh, as we discuss this. So let's, let's talk about what does it mean? What does it mean to be apart and apart? Uh, what does it mean to be not in the class with your peers at different ages? What are the consequences and how can we minimize them? For the most part, as we're giving these talks, we, we, we're coming to the realization we can't solve problems, but we can sort of make them not so bad. And that's what that's what we're focusing on. Now, again, the academic piece and the academic consequences, uh, Mrs. Ross will address, but I'm going to talk about it from the psychological perspective. So one one consequence is that levels of stimulation are less. Their, their world is this less exposure, if you will, less immediate exposure that a child their age would typically have. And Actual stimulation, intellectual stimulation, visual stimulation is important. Many years ago, psychologists used to do these uh, stimulus deprivation experiments where they would take people, they would pay college freshmen, because college freshmen for a few bucks will do just about anything, and ask them to volunteer to spend two days in a room. And in the room, they would be, they would be blindfolded and they would have like headphones, but with white noise, so they wouldn't hear anything. And they would be fed and they'd be comfortable, but they'd have no visual or auditory stimulation. And, and, and it was, it created high, very heightened levels of anxiety and distress, many couldn't even last. We, we need stimulation. And therefore, part of what's been happening with quarantining and, and, and far more limited socialization, um, we are stimulus deprived. And, and many of us are feeling the, uh, the effects of this and it is, it, it is noxious. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting, I even observed myself uh, from the very beginning, and it's still true, that I've had very vivid dreams and when I, when I first noticed this, I even mentioned to my wife, I think it's because I have less visual stimulation. My brain is compensating and I'm there for having very graphic dreams. And sure enough, I read an article subsequently that that's indeed the case that they've noticed many people are reporting very graphic dreams because of the, the sensory deprivation. So that's going to be definitely the case because there's much less personal the contact is even in terms of what they see and they're exposed to is somewhat limited. So that's, that's part of the, what, what the price they're paying. There also can be too much of a good thing. Um, it's interesting that our understanding of family relationships and even marriage that they're very often uh, nurtured and bred by being apart and coming together. That's a very important part of relationships that, that and, I, and I'm sure we're all aware that when you're apart from something and come back to it, you come to it with a fresh perspective and you come to it with a sort of excitement you wouldn't have otherwise. And the very time honored process of children leaving, going to school, coming back to the home, it, there's something healthy about it and it makes it healthier for relationships. There is that excitement of the sort of reunion. Uh, this is a problem just to give an example from another setting, sometimes in marital work. It's very challenging when the husband and wife work in the same setting, if they have a store together. I mean, not if they're in the same accounting firms, but on different floors, but um, you know, if they are actually working together, which is not uncommon, especially in a, in a, in a business, in an individually owned business or family owned business. And that it can complicate the relationship when you're with each other so much all day and sometimes, or for the matter of father and son. Um, and therefore it's sometimes beneficial if they have still their own sort of niche and they, they have that experience being apart and coming together, but certainly the child who is home constantly, and I'm saying, you know, even in situations where there is a wholesome and a healthy relationship, it's still, there is there's something to be said for the opportunity to, to get a, to be apart uh, from the parent and not be on top of each other so much. Um, also, there's the social training, the social education, if you will, that takes place in school. It's not part of the formal education, but dealing with people, dealing with conflict, uh, choosing friends, uh, learning not to be offensive even, to learn uh, what we would call in Hebrew midot, you know, to learn how to interact with others is a very big part of the culturation of school. And again, is compromised when the child is, is not... Uh, Together with the, you know, not together with the peers in that kind of immediate 
way. So there's, there is, there is a, a price to pay for it. And although I, I do have to add that there are some children for whom the remote learning is actually and beneficial. Some of the kids who have social difficulties are finding themselves less challenged and less uh, stressed by being remote. Some of the ADHD kids, although the research is in consequence, some data that suggests ADHD children are having a lot of time, but for some of them, the, the very fact that they're learning remotely and they, they're not confined to a desk and they can sort of move around and have some of the, out, some of the physical outlet that they, they can have by learning remotely actually is beneficial to them. But for the most part, there is a price to be paid. Now, let, let me analyze this situation from the different ages as well, because it's a very different experience for an elementary school. So we'll focus for us on elementary school age children and high school age children. Being apart from their peers in this way have very different consequences depending on the age of the child. Um, and that's because the, the relevance of the peer group or the nature of the relationship to the peer group differs from, let's say, the elementary school age child and the adolescent. The elementary school age child, while they may have individual friends and there might be certain children that they gravitate towards, first of all, very often for the elementary school age child, the, the best friend is someone who's geographically close by. That's just for convenience sake. They're not taking public transportation. Parents may not want to drive 20 minutes to a child. So very often their best friend or not best friend is determined by geography and certainly wouldn't be the case with the adolescent. But also, the, but the main connection on sort of emotional level is to the group, is to the larger peer culture, to the class at large. And, and not as much necessarily to individual members or individual subsets within the classroom. So there is this sort of like uh, collective belonging and very often the group, in this case, the classroom, share interests, preferences, et cetera. So the absence of one or when, when a child is in any way different or separated at this age, um, A, it's hard. That was my oversight. I'm sorry, give me just a second to turn off my phone. That was an oversight on my part, please forgive me. Um, okay. Um, so that's very hard when they're apart from, from the group. For example, even in our, some of our, our bereavement work, when, uh, God forbid, a, a child loses a parent, for the elementary school age child, they very much want to be normal. They don't want to be identified as, oh, you're the child whose parent died. They, want, they don't want to be separated from the broader group. So when you are the one child or the one of two children who is confined or is, is learning from uh, learning remotely, you're different. And sometimes as well, because the reasons for the, the child being uh, learning remotely is something that's threatening and scary, whether it's the, the death of a parent, the, the illness of a parent, uh, et cetera. So sometimes that is, a, is experienced by the kids. And again, I don't mean this in the, in the sense that they're mean or anything, but experienced by the children as a threat. And therefore the child who is different is sometimes subject to bullying or being excluded and, and, or being teased or something like that by the broader group. Not because again, that they're inherently cruel children, but being separate, being apart, being sort of removed from the border group for this age is, is, is threatening. In fact, for example, even if in, in the field of bullying, which again, is not our topic, but bullying in elementary school is very often the bigger group singling out one person to pick on them. And when you get to high school and, and junior or middle school, it's usually the subgroups. It's usually the, the, the gangs, the cliques, you know, the, where, where some of the bullying takes place. Or, uh, so, so it's, this, is, this can be difficult for them and therefore they're, they're feeling apart not necessarily even from the kids themselves, but from the climate, from the atmosphere, from the rhythm of the class. It's hard and exacerbated because sometimes the child uh, is, that's identified very much by the other children. And how that can be managed by the teachers as well. So we'll see about, but I'll talk about what, what, a, what a parent can do. Um, and then with the adolescent, then the peer group now becomes much more important than individual members or subgroups become suddenly much more important in a very natural and expected way because the adolescent, part of adolescence is growing up in what we call separation individuation is moving away from the family, connecting, getting away from 
that inbred family and therefore and move, moving towards the peer group. And the peer group, the peers suddenly becomes very important. I'm sure many of us who have raised adolescents have had this experience where uh, suddenly the friend, uh, you know, is suddenly more important, more valued, and even more respected sometimes than even the parent. So this shift becomes very important. Therefore, being apart from those very important peers is almost like a um, it's like a roadblock for their development because they're naturally gravitating towards the peers. So this can become can have very devastating consequences. In some respects, with the adolescent, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, if you will, because uh, on the one hand. Um, the adolescent, again, there's the potency of that connection to the peers and wanting to be with the peers, on a, even on a personal level, wanting to shift almost like a lot of that attention and affection that's usually preserved to parents uh, to the peer group. So that, and the other factor that's important with peers is that peers uh, and teens will be, will be rebellious by nature. And again, that's even normal, you want it. It's again, it's their assertion of their individuality but uh, then they're gonna question, is it really necessary? Do I really have to stand? Do I really have to practice this level or this degree of separation? And you might have a conflict in hand, bred maybe and motivated by the wish to be with the peers, but also feeding it very naturally with a uh, teen's uh, rebellious nature. But there is one positive note that you'll have with, with teens that you wouldn't necessarily, with middle school and, and high school that you wouldn't have with elementary school is that the, the, the teenager is, cognitively is in a it can more readily connect or understand someone else's predicament and without i don't want this to be a psychological lecture and it's already used up a lot of my time but um the adolescent is capable cognitively to sort of leave themselves and experience somebody else's predicament far more readily than uh, uh elementary school age child can so the the teenage classmates can appreciate the particular predicament of the kid who has to learn remotely. They can understand the necessity because there's a parent to Zillow, a parent who had died, or there's a parent that works in a healthcare facility and therefore can put themselves in the other person's position and be more sympathetic and extend themselves more to make the, the teen more comfortable. Let me just talk about a few things you can do and then you know, hand it over to Ms. Ross. Um, First of all, as much as possible, and this goes without saying, try to include the child in the group and into the ways that you can. In many ways you can, maybe you can have get togethers outdoors. Maybe they can join the, the classmates if it works out logistically when they're having recess and when they're in a setting where you feel more secure that, 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 that they'll be safe. Um, make sure they're well-informed, make sure work with the school, work with the teacher that they know what's going on, that they're, again, that they're in the rhythm of the class. What's, what are the kids talking about? More important, not even so much in terms of formal classroom, but because that, that's certainly easier, but what are they, what's the latest fad? What are they talking about? What are they telling secrets about? What are they into? And let them feel as much as possible that they're part of it because this, this is very important. Um, it's important and that if you can make it up to them, if they're having a hard time, you can make, especially it's a little easier with the younger children, with special toys, treats, um, ordering out, whatever you can. Again, I, I'm, I'm always very generous with other people's money, but the uh, ways in which you can make, you know, take, a, you know, compensate for them, especially as they may be doing this for someone else, make it worthwhile. A little spoiling, it's not going to do any harm overindulging, especially as we're going through this, especially as they are making sacrifices, can make it, can make it uh, easier for them. Try to fight the monotony of the home, the, the, the limitations, by introducing interesting different things that are going on. Cooking different meals, you can maybe have, again, I'm throwing out crazy ideas, but you know, maybe uh, every week there's a different nationality whose food that you cook. Uh, maybe having games within the house, whether it's scavenger hunts or other types of, and the creativity, by the way, during this pandemic has really been impressive. And so therefore we, we can capitalize on that and uh, try to try not try to give the try to give the, the home more stimulation, excitement than you would have to otherwise because they get more than enough in their full day at school. In fact, usually when they're going to school, they come home, they need uh, predictability and some more soothing sort of experiences and uh, sort of to kind of lower 
the the intensity of matters but here you may have to from time to time make an interesting fun uh creative uh experience a, as much as possible um don't ever put down their concerns if they're complaining to you if they're explaining to you how hard it is for them it's never good to minimize and put down how hard how difficult it is because that it's first of all it's a reality and second of all Given what's going on right now, we, we, it's more important that children feel validated and feel that it's legit and it is legitimate. It is a big sacrifice not to be in school, to be apart from your peer group. And if they complain to you, don't try to talk about it. Don't try to tell them it's no big deal. It is a big deal. And you actually will help the child more if you acknowledge for them how important it is than if you try to talk them out of it. If What's operative is, and I alluded to this earlier, is high levels of anxiety. Either high levels of anxiety in the parents or high levels of anxiety in the child. And again, as I said, this is, I'm not saying there's any judgment, but if it's, if there is a price being paid, if the child is distressed and it, your decision or the child's decision to stay back is governed by levels of anxiety, that can be addressed. And maybe that would be a point to try to address the anxiety with professional help or if you can on your own. Um, so that they might be able to resume at least partially or gradually uh, so some of that socialization. Um, again, keep in mind that every child is different. Every child are maybe at different stages of development. And for some children's interpersonal contact and the social realm is more important than others. And so therefore for that child, the, <coughs> the sacrifice may be even greater. And then for some, it's it it's not as much because they're by nature not so and that's not that's okay also we are we're, we're allowed to be very different there's room for differences in that, our community and some people by nature just don't have that same craving for social contact and of course that'll be easier for them and I think last but not least and I thought I will I'll conclude with that is for, oh by the way one more thing also I'm gonna and then I'll get to the last but not least um, it's important to remind our children to remind ourselves this won't be forever. Uh, I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict. I, I love to quote the great rabbinic figure, Yogi Berra, who used to say predicting is very difficult, especially about the future. Um, we, we can't predict. But if we look historically, most events like this, whether it's epidemics, pandemics, even other types of economic setbacks, et cetera, have a beginning, middle, and end, and this will have a beginning, middle, and end. I mean, we seem to be on the cusp of a vaccine. I don't know where that'll go and what will happen with this, but I think we can safely predict that there'll be a point where we won't have to have these kind of ex exhaustive safety precautions and we'll, life will be safer in that respect. And um, we can resume life probably changed, but uh, back to the way it had been. And we can remind our children who are paying a dear price that that'll be the case. They don't have the same time perspective we do. They don't have those years to reflect on and we have to tell them that. And then again, as I mentioned, many of them are doing it for the sake of other people. And I think it's, an, it's a wonderful opportunity to teach children what sacrifice is. Um, the capacity or necessity or sometimes having to do without or make sacrifices either for ourselves or, or for others is a, is a, is a diminishing art. Um, we live in an age and a time when everything just comes to us. Everything is so easy. Technology has so changed the world that the, the necessity to make sacrifices for something is, is still there, but not as much. And then we have a situation now where we can teach children how giving up something important to themselves either for the greater good of their, their health or for the, the greater good of members of the family is something to be valued. Uh, I'll conclude with a personal story. And, and I think it touches upon sacrifice. Often, I used to tell my children about the one of, one of if not the nicest gift I ever got. I was uh, in second grade. I was in public school at the time. And the minute I'm the custom there was that when you had a birthday, at the end of the school day, your mother would come to school and she'd bring cupcakes or cookies or something like that. And the children have a treat and then they would put on their coats and everything to leave. And the, birth the birthday boy would stand by the door and everybody would have to say happy birthday to the birthday boy or girl. And it was my birthday and my mother brought the, the cupcakes or whatever. And I was standing by the door and it was leaving my best friend at the time. Uh, actually, I think if I recall correctly, I think it was an Hispanic child, but uh, he was my best friend. And as he left, he said, he said to me, he was going to have birthday. He said, he asked me, he said, no, and what's your favorite color? So I don't remember what I said. I must have said blue or something like that. And he reached into his book bag and he took out his Crayola crayon box and he gave me his blue crayon. Um, that's sacrifice. And that's, I think, a skill that we can emphasize and we can reframe as our children are, in a way, depriving themselves of something so important 
for the sake of the family members of the sake of the community. I went over a little bit of my time, but I'm now looking forward myself to hear from Mrs. Ross and uh, we'll address it from a teacher's educator's perspective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blumenthal, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tsipora Ross. I've been in education for over 25 years, um, mostly at the middle school level, uh, working with students from grades five to eight. So that's sort of my wheelhouse of the, the kind of age group I know, uh, where, as Dr. Blumenthal said, that, that social piece, being with peers, getting the approval of peers is so, so important. Uh, so if those are your children, um, th then, you know, I, I, I understand. I, I work with those kinds of kids all day, both remotely and in person. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, some of the, what I think might be the primary concerns that, that people are thinking about, parents are thinking about, and then, and then um, some, some suggestions uh, that, that uh, you know, that I think as a, as a teacher, I think would, may, may help. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. And um, so first of all, um, when we think about some of the, the main concerns, um, what Dr. Blumenthal alluded to quite a bit was the, the social and emotional impact um, on, on your child or your children. You know, how are they coping with things given, uh, given that their lives are upended and, and the sort of routine of being in school and, and, and being with friends and, and, you know, running around at recess and uh, who am I going to partner up with? Those are things that are not happening or not happening in the way that they're used to. Um, and I think, you know, th thinking about the day to day, um, who do I sit with at lunch today? Um, we're going to go have a project and which group am I going to be put in for the project? Um, um, you know, who am I walking home from school with or playing at recess with? And all of those kinds of social choices that are so important for growth of children is, is either limited or not happening at all. Um, so that's, and those are real learning opportunities that, that your child might not be getting because they can't negotiate and deal with, you know, when someone isn't nice to them or, or when someone turns them down when they ask them to sit at lunch, um, you know, and so those, those are real genuine concerns. Um, second thing is the Zoom fatigue. Um, if you are learning remotely and the 20 kids in your class are learning in person, and your schedule is the same as the kids in class, but obviously the, uh, the you know the fatigue and how tired you get being on a screen all day long and sitting in a room by yourself or mostly by yourself all day long uh, without that stimulation is is very very hard and and it's very very draining. Um, and we all saw that in the in the spring when everybody was was remote. Certainly in this region, everybody was remote and how how difficult that was. And now your children are being asked to do that. And continue to do that even when uh, a lot of their peers are not. Um, and then there's the concern, and it's also a real concern, is the academic loss. Is my child going to have the reading skills, the language skills, the math skills, the homage skills uh, that their peers have because they have, you know, they're learning in, in, in what is a, a different way um, than, than everybody else. So, um, I have some suggestions uh, in terms of responding to some of these these concerns and some strategies. Um, so one thing I think is to advocate for your child. I think that's a, a very, very uh, important role that a parent has and and even possibly more so in in the you know in the zoom world where um, if the teacher is there in person with 20 students and he or she has to give their attention to those 20 students. And then there are a handful of students on Zoom or remote learning. So that child, those children have to have the um, sort of the, uh, the gumption to speak up for themselves. And not all of them are gonna do that. And certainly they're not gonna do that in fifth or sixth grade. They might not feel like I can advocate for myself and nor should they have to. Um, so I think that's really something that a parent can do. Um, and, you know, could be that if your child has somebody as a role in it, as an advisor in my school in Ramaz, we have advisors. I have a group of eighth grade girls. I'm their advisor. I'm their point person uh, when they are struggling or when they are having concerns, whether they're struggling emotionally, academically, socially, and whether they're in person or remote. And I have some kids who are fully remote. 
I'm the person they go to. And even if their 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 struggle is in math or you know a different subject, I'm still the person that they go to. So if your school has that sort of point person in place, then that's obviously the natural connection between the parent and the rest of the school, the rest of the teachers that the, the, chi- the child sees, the administration even that the child sees. I think that that's one way to do it. If, if your school doesn't have that in place, but you, you know that, oh, you know, Mrs. So-and-so and my child have a really good relationship from previous year or uh, the school psychologist or, or someone else who can be that, that in-person advocate because you are the parent advocate. Of course, you want what is absolutely the best for your child. Of course, that's as a parent, of course, that's how we all feel. Um, but if you can find someone in school who can be that advocate for your child, I think that would really make a difference. Um, and, and, and one very easy thing that you can do is just, you know, remind your child or remind the teacher to call on your child somewhat, you know, once, once, a, once a period, once a lesson, call, call your child's name or even just use your child's name in an example. And then that brings both brings your child to, oh, I sit up straight because I just got called on by the teacher. And the other kids also hear your child's name, you know, in the classroom so that it, it takes away some of that anonymity of your child not actually being, um, being present. And then I would also want to say that you should communicate how is your child handling all of this? Dr. Blumenthal spoke about the, you know, the sort of isolation that your child might be feeling, the sacrifice that they are really undertaking at an age that might be young to have to have to undertake a sacrifice. Um, so, you know, let the school know how your child is handling the, the uh, you know, the emotional part of it and the academic part of it. Um, in terms of number two of other ways to connect socially, and Dr. Blumenthal alluded to some of these ideas also, is are there other ways that your child can connect to classmates? Um, whether that is, you know, that they're going on a trip that's outside a hike, a, a boating, something like that, where you'll feel m- more comfortable health-wise with them participating in something like that. Can they be part of it? Can they be part of a, of a recess or an outdoor period? Um, is there a way for them to collaborate remotely but collaborate in something that's more fun, um, designing a game for the group. Um, is there a way to have, uh, you know, if, if the students are sitting and having lunch in their cohort room, as my students do, they really don't, don't leave the room where they're learning all day. And they are also kind of stuck sitting at a desk all day. So what happens during lunch? They're all kind of sitting on a screen and having lunch, they're not really supposed to talk with their mask off. Can can your child join that kind of virtual lunch date with a student or a couple of students together, make a little group together and, and, and eat lunch together? And even if that means that most of the time they're just sort of looking at each other munching, that's okay. Um, you know, but there is going to be that, can, that genuine, hopefully that genuine connection. Um, and then, you know, something like playing some online games, whether that's in school, out of school, um, whether that's an academic type of game, a Kahoot to review for, a, for an upcoming test, or it's a, um, you know, something more, more, just more fun and social. Um, I know my, my students and, and, and uh, some of my children are very into a new game called Among Us, um, which is, a, you know, a pretty power of game. As, as games go, um, not very violent. I mean, there is some, some killing, but there's no, you know, it's not Fortnite. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strategic game and it's something that, you know, you can get other kids involved in. So that's, that's, a, that's a, another way to connect socially. Um, and then that transitions to the next thing, which is flexibility with screen time. We know that um, about a year ago, there was a big push, certainly in, in my community in Bergen County, um, to a, a kind of an alarming evening about screen usage among teens. And uh, I think that entire thing has been flipped on its head because now all day long, our kids are sitting on screens and looking at screens and connecting through screens and learning through screens. So I think we kind of have to loosen the reins a little bit um, when it comes to screen, if that's a way that, that your child is going to be able to socialize fully, whether that's during the school day or after school, um, so they can really feel a part um, socially with their peers. And yet, you know, still we are the parent. Um, there, there should be rules. There should be limits. The, the, you know, I would say that the, uh, I would advocate for the, the, the phone or the, or the device, the iPad, whatever, should not be in the bedroom overnight. 
um, f- you know, find a place, the kitchen, uh, your room, you know, somewhere where it's not there so that the last thing the child does is not be on a screen, but, you know, be reading a book or, or doing listening to music, doing something relaxing that, that doesn't involve screen, because as we know, being on the screen all day is really, really, really hard, really taxing. Um, and with that, so keeping your child accountable, right? So your child is learning from home. Um, you know, do they have a, a, a schedule? Do they have a good, a firm wake up time where they're expected to get up, um, you know, expected to get dressed? Uh, you know, at, at least the upper half is dressed, but let's hope that the bottom half is also, you know, dressed in a way that if, if they were actually sitting in school, it would be appropriate. Maybe not shoes, you know, slippers are okay, or even socks, but, you know, to, 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 to present yourself in a way that, you know, you're going to take yourself as a child, you're going to take yourself more seriously if you're dressed in a way that, that shows it, even if you're the only one who really can see that. Um, do they have a good workspace where they're going to be sitting? They're not zooming from their bed. Uh, they, you know, they should have a desk, even if it's in their own room, but they should have a desk or, or a, you know, a, a solid chair and a place to work and the supplies that they need, the pens, the pencils, the highlighters, uh, the charging cord, the earbuds, whatever they needed, you know, as well as the books um, to, to fully prepare, to fully be part of it. Um, noise canceling headphones, if there are multiple children in a shared space and it's, you know, and it's noisy and they need to focus on what, what's going on in the class. Um, and then that, you know, that there should to minimize the distractions, right? Because if they're sitting on Zoom and, you know, and you're also trying to work, you're not going to sit necessarily be able to sit next to your child while they're in class, nor should you have to, I would hope. Um, certainly for middle school children, you should not have to. Um, but then the, the, the ability to get distracted is so easy and so, so tempting to, you know, play a game while your teacher is talking or, or, or check, check an email or, you know, check a text or, or go on a YouTube video. So if there's a way to kind of block those abilities during the school day, um, I think, you know, your child may not like it, but I think that they'll, they'll get more out of their school time. And then finally, um, rewarding and modeling. Um, so, and, and Dr. Blumenthal alluded to some of these ideas also. So I think if you can set very, very low and very specific expectations, um, if your child is not going to make it through a whole Zoom day, I get it, and it's hard. So, you know, say, okay, so then so then you're going to, let's just do, you know, this period, this class, or let's spend um, these 15 minutes, set a timer, 15 minutes of reading, 15 minutes of, of homework, 15 minutes of class participation, whatever it is. And when it's over, then we'll talk about what the reward would be. And the reward doesn't have to be money, and the reward doesn't have to be more screen time. The reward can be you know, you and I will go out somewhere together or we'll spend some time together outside or uh, you'll get to decide what we're going to have for dinner tonight or we're going to have a family game night. You get to pick what the family game night can be. Um, and then in terms of the modeling, um, I would say that number one is to, to model your own excitement. And, you know, you're also if you're if you're working remotely and as, as hard as that can be as well, because you also don't have that social outlook and social network of, you know, of working, let's say, in, in what what you would have been doing had had the world been more open than it is currently. Um, but model that, you know what, this is my work day, I'm excited, I'm, I'm dressed, I'm ready, and I'm, I'm going to be part of it. And, um, you know, and, 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 and model for your child also that you're excited for them. You know, I want, you know, after after your your history class today, I want to te- I want to hear something about what you're learning or, or, you know, tell me about that project that you're doing or how that test was. What was a what was a question you asked today in class? That's another another good bar to set. You know, make sure to I, I want you to ask three questions over the course of the school day to your teacher, whether that's remotely, you know, where you raise your hand and you speak out or whether that's sending something in a chat or say following up with an email or something where, you know, you, you set a standard for your child. That's a very, very achievable standard. And I think, you know, I think it'll, it'll make it, make it easier and just make the goals that much more, more doable. So I, you know, I thank you. Those are some of my thoughts Um, as a teacher, as a parent, um, my students are, uh, my children are mostly in school, but not, not fully in school, depending on what day of the week it is. Um, and my students are also mostly in school and not fully in school. Uh, some of them are completely remote. They are all remote one week and then in one week. Uh, so that presents its own challenges as a teacher. Uh, and, and as Dr. Blumenthal said, there, there will be an end 
God willing, and uh, and they'll be able to say they lived through a, an unprecedented time in history. Um, you know, I tell that to my students uh, all the time. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Russ, and uh, very informative and very relevant, and I appreciated it. Um, uh, does anybody have particular questions that you want to ask either, because again, we don't have a huge group here, um, or we did get some questions in, so maybe I can start with those, and, and then if people have questions or comments or input, for, you know, we'll, we'll welcome them. Here was one that I thought was probably falls more in my lap, but I thought it was an interesting question, is uh, how will, what will be the long-term effects of not being around, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the question because I don't want to divulge where it came from, but what are going to be the long-term effects of children being deprived of the socialization and will they, what, what's it going to look like when they come back and will they be able to reclaim those social skills? And I, I thought that was an intriguing question. Again, it's, it's an unanswerable one because I have to go back to my Yogi Berra quote. Uh, we, we just don't know, we can't predict the future. Um, I will say, just have a few thoughts about it and I, I can share. And again, I welcome if Ms. Ross has any thoughts about that question. Uh, first of all, it's always easier to reclaim a skill than to start it from scratch. So for most of our children, who have had already some of those social skills that were you know, as Russell alluded to in terms of negotiating their peer culture. Most of them have had so several years of that already before this was uh, sort of aborted now as a result of, of the, the pandemic. So when they get back to more relaxed, normal uh, interactions, those skills will come back. And it's sort of like if you haven't ridden, rode a bike for many years and you get on a bike, it comes back to you uh, pretty quickly. But there are certain social skills that are dependent upon the age and may not have been acquired. And uh, as, as it says in, in Proverbs, uh, things are best acquired in their time. And I can tell you as a psychologist, when people have missed out on certain important interpersonal experiences at the age that they typically would um, to, re to, to capture it later on is more difficult. And I could well imagine, we, we do live in a day and age where a lot of skills that used to be acquired more naturally are now being taught. And I, I think maybe schools and parents have to think that when this uh, more relaxed collective socialization resumes that some skills may actually have to be taught and instructed and maybe we have to identify what those skills might be. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Mr. Ross, about the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that kids are resilient and, you know, and, sure. and they, they do bounce back, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, anything that you can do at home to help with the social skills with, you know, and obviously then the negotiation instead of being with peers is gonna probably be with siblings, assuming they have siblings. It's gonna be with parents, you know, so they, they do have that adult child interaction. It's just different than they would with a teacher, right? Um, and you can model certainly that behavior, you know, give them a scenario of, uh, you know, let's pretend that we're, you know, you, 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 uh, you know, you did something in class or, that you would, you maybe you shouldn't have. How would you work? What would you do? What would you mm. say? You know, model and pretend. Just play it. Play it out. Oh, that's a good point. It's actually, it's interesting that there's some. You know, we, very often we've been emphasizing how parents have to be coordinated and work in, in sync with one another, and that's still pretty important. But there's an interesting body of literature that shows that parents who can have disagreements but never let it get out of hand. In other words, can respectfully disagree or work out differences and the children see that actually those children are better off socially because they come to school with conflict resolution skills. So I guess you can get somebody home. So maybe one of the things you should do tonight is pick a fight with your husband or wife and <laughs> resolve it. Okay, uh, here's a, an anonymous, I mean, a private question. Was any insight into helping an eight-year-old child moderate their fear over being ridiculed or rejected by peers on Zoom? Uh, in this case, uh, her child refuses to turn the camera on because of his fear. And that, that is very much a, a concern and probably, I don't know the age of the child involved. Oh, it's an eight-year-old child, right. So it's, it's probably an elementary school age child because that's the age where that kind of collective ridicule, as I mentioned earlier, is more likely to occur. 
Um, what, what I like to do in situations like this, um, <clears throat> first of all, you can always, again, validate. It's um, important to let them know that it's a very natural feeling and it's, it hurts to be ridiculed. Um, sometimes it's good to share with the child situations of your own than you were a child and you were singled out and ridiculed and it implicit in that story is the message look I turned out okay you know it didn't it didn't damage you forever but another uh, intervention that I'd like to do in situations like this is in a way and I'm going to have to be careful how I frame this but is to sort of get angry about it like to say to the child well what makes them such big what makes them think they're so cool or what are the, you know, who do, they, who do they think they are that they can say something like this to you? Now, I'm doing two things when I do that. First of all, the child feels hurt and I'm sort of like, and even in an imaginary way, I'm, I'm sort of retaliating for the child, but I'm also modeling for the child what is often the best response to ridicule, which is to show a disregard for it. And if you try to tease back, then they have to tease back more. And there is an imbalance in these situations. I, I should have mentioned that earlier. You know, the child who is learning remotely needs the peer group more than the peer group needs that child. So they're, they're, it's not an even playing field. Um, but to say to the child, that it, but that kind of modeling for the child, that kind of disregard for what the person says. By, by responding in a way sort of figuratively, aggressively, sometimes makes the child feel better and also shows the child how to respond to that and therefore um, minimize that kind of taunting and teasing. A very young child, if it's, if it's it, again, very young, if I'm an eight-year-old still a very young child, sometimes you can contact the teacher and see if the teacher can intervene because they're still in an age in which they very much are obedient and fear the teacher. And if the teacher makes it clear that this is not acceptable or ties it in with Jewish values that say such that, that you know, publicly humiliating somebody is not something we do as, as Torah Jews and things like that, and still can probably make a difference. The risk you run is that you know the 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 other kids could look at the kid as a tattletale or someone who has to run to the teacher for assistance, and that might, uh, in a way, paradoxically breed more uh, teasing. But as I said with the younger kids, you can a teacher can more readily take charge than that than with the older children. As far as not wanting to turn the the, the screen on. Uh, if it's really bad, so it doesn't turn the screen on, but uh, I would encourage him as much about turn the screen on, just not care mm -hmm. what the children say. Uh, does anything you want to add, Ms. Ross, in terms of that? Uh, no, I think those are all really valid points. And, uh, you know, the, the bullying obviously gets gets heightened in the middle school era and uh, and and it's hard. And, and validating your, your child's concerns, I think, is 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 not the number one thing to do so they know that you take them seriously because for them obviously it is the most serious thing that 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 acceptance is so so important mm -hmm. sure so one question came in about children with adhd and learning disabilities and i as i mentioned we will be doing a webinar specifically on the issue of adhd mm -hmm. um maybe we'll do one on learning disabilities as well um i'll just mention one point which i've mentioned in other webinars i think is important especially as we're talking about children who may have be, be getting some sort of remediation or resource room that the experience of um of of beginning a remediation and not completing it in other words and which is what's been happening to a lot of children that they're or you know they're 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 making some initial gains and then if it has to be prematurely aborted it's very hard to get them started again because they don't the, the, their previous experience has been disappointing and they haven't had that positive experience of seeing results so it is, a, it is a challenge to really sort of get the children back into it. Again, maybe that's more of an educational issue. I don't know if you have any thoughts about those. Although it's a pretty broad issue topic, Ms. Ross, but in terms of children with learning disabilities or ADHD and being, you know, learning on Zoom or perhaps, like I'm not clear from the question, maybe being the only ones who are uh, learning right. remotely. Hmm. Yeah, that is that is a it is a major challenge and and obviously the skills that and the progress that a child makes in person are are is going to be probably qualitatively better than something that's going to be done remotely sure. mm -hmm. yeah i can tell you personally doing therapy almost exclusively remotely i'm, I'm finding with adults it's uh it, it with adults it's it's actually working pretty well but with kids they need that more that connection and I'm finding that it's much harder 
to do remote therapy with, with, with children. Okay, so I wanna thank all of you for coming. I know we're coming towards the end. I do wanna mention that this, this webinar has been recorded and it takes usually two, three days for the tech team at OHIL to sort of edit it and fine tune it and probably screen out all my bad jokes. But uh, the, it will be available in a few days uh, on the OHIL website and I believe on YouTube as well. So if you know anybody who wants or wants to, to didn't have a chance to come tonight and would like to participate in this uh, webinar, you know, or, or want to hear it, that it'll be available in a few days. Um, and again, I want to thank Ms. Ross for taking her time and for, for participating uh, with us and adding that the very important dimension. And again, anybody who has more specific issues, myself and Ms. Ross, and then want to discuss further, um, you can, you know, contact, actually, you could contact Laura Bart, who was the person who I think might have been the contact person to register for this, but actually, no, we registered, we just did a link, so maybe that's not relevant, but my email address is norman underscore blumenthal at ohillfamily.org. That's norman underscore blumenthal at ohillfamily.org. Please feel free to contact me and um, I'll make my time available. Or if there's a question, Ms. Ross, I'll follow, I'll forward over to her. You don't have to get the two email addresses. <laughs> okay, so again, thank you very much. And uh, uh, please join us for future webinars, which we'll be having shortly. Okay, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. good night. Good night, okay.